Hello and welcome to the BAPAC Q3 2018 Interim Update Call. Throughout the call, all participants will be in a listen-only mode, and afterwards there will be a question and answer session. Today, I'm pleased to present Gerard Polidis, member of the Executive Board and CFO. Please go ahead with your meeting. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning, and welcome to the third quarter interim update of Royal Falpak. In the next 20 to 30 minutes, I will update you on the developments of the third quarter, and my prepared remarks will refer to the analyst presentation as published on our website this morning while making reference to the slide numbers. As an interim update, I will focus mainly on the results. However, based on feedback during this year, we've decided to add various financial items <coughs> in this interim update to accommodate shareholder and analyst views. After this presentation, there will be time for questions. Also, for the follow-up on any specific questions, you may, of course, contact our investor relations team. I'm going to slide two. I refer to the disclaimer content of the forward-looking statement, which you are very familiar with. The clarifications in this statement should be taken into account with respect to any looking forward ahead comments and or guidance provided. Accordingly, this disclaimer is applicable to the entire call, including the answers provided to your questions during the Q&A session. With that said, I will now turn to slide three for the key messages. This quarter, we delivered a solid performance and commissioned the first phase of our new industrial terminal PT2SB in Pengarang, Malaysia. Our year-to-date EBITDA, excluding exceptional items, was 550 million. Adjusted for 20 million euros at first currency translation effects, our EBITDA was 3 million euros higher than prior year even though we operated at an occupancy rate of 86%. This 86% is at the lower end of our 10-year range, but up by one percentage point from the second quarter. We delivered a quarter with resilient cash flow from operations and momentum in investment levels, driven by our growth projects in South Africa, Panama, Brazil, and Deer Park. And end of September, the industrial terminal PT2SB in Malaysia commissioned 700,000 cubic meters of capacity. The remainder of the capacity, bringing it towards 1.5 million cubic meters, is scheduled to be commissioned before the end of the third quarter, 2019, in line with the commissioning schedules of Petronas and Saudi Aramco's uh, rapid project. Furthermore, we continue to deliver on our growth ambition with the expansion of our global LPG and chemical gases network in the Netherlands and in South Africa. Turning to slide four, you will see that the year-to-date third quarter EBITDA, again excluding exceptional items, decreased by 3% compared to the same period in the previous year. Adjusted for currency effects, the underlying EBITDA was 3 million euros higher than prior year. The Asia and Middle East division and the Europe and Africa division reduced financial performance at the hub locations due to a less favorable oil market structure. Strong performance in the Americas and China and North Asia were supported by the good business environment in the chemical segment. Turning to slide five, where we will focus on the third quarter versus the second quarter. In our last call, I commented on a total of 4 million euros positive one-off result in Q2 and across reporting divisions. This quarter, earnings do not show noteworthy net items influencing the numbers. Q3 EBITDA came in at 180 million euros an improvement compared to the previous quarter. So let's turn to slide six and look at the divisional performance. Occupancy rate in the Europe and Africa division saw some support in the oil segment in the Netherlands, resulting in an improved financial performance. 
Asia Middle East Division showed a comparable occupancy rate as the previous quarter. And Australia is performing well and benefited in Q2 from various one-off settlements in aggregate of 10 million euros as mentioned before. The chemicals occupancy rates have been stable, which is noticeable in the strong performance of our Americas division. And switching to China, China occupancy is sensitive to small changes in our subsidiaries Xiangxigang and Langshan that reported lower occupancy levels in this quarter. Joint venture industrial terminals, which are operating at higher occupancy rates, are not included in this calculation. Financial performance for China and Northeast Asia improved as our industrial terminal in Hai Teng in China contributed the full quarter after it restarted operations in June. On Hai Teng, also various discussions on financial aspects from the downtime period that is now mostly behind us continue to progress for settlement. The LNG division saw an increase in costs related to new business development, where we continue to invest and have good momentum. The German LNG project is progressing really well on the commercial and the technical aspects, and in China the LNG project is also progressing. In Pakistan, we see further opportunity to expand our earlier announced position to take a 29% participation in the LNG terminal uh, announced in July. Our joint venture terminals uh, for LNG in Mexico and Gate in the Netherlands showed strong occupancy rates of 95%. Turning to slide 7 and looking at the quarterly developments of our key figures. Financial results delivered this quarter are solid, although occupancy was 86%. Financial re results reflected cost and commercial performance. Tank storage demand at our hub terminals remains impacted by the oil market structure in 2018 year to date, whereas chemicals, gases and industrial terminals showed stable demand for tank storage services. In terms of capital efficiency, we delivered a return on capital employed of 11.8% in the third quarter, and net profit attributable to holders of ordinary shares amounted to 71 million euros, resulting in an earnings per share of 55 euro cents in the third quarter, and year to date, 1 euro and 65 uh, cents per share. Moving to cash flow. Slide number eight. Q3 showed another quarter with resilient cash flow from operations. Our year-to-date gross cash flow from operations was almost 500 million euros, which resulted in close to 280 million euros free cash flow before growth. We have investment momentum towards 2019 and invested just over 200 million euros of capital to our growth projects. Free cash flow available for financing debt service and shareholder distributions amounted to 100 million this year. Our net debt position of 1.7 billion euros resulted in a net debt to EBITDA ratio just above 2.2 at the end of the third quarter. This cash flow from operations, combined with the financial flexibility of our balance sheet, provides us with a position to keep investing in our project portfolio and create shareholder value. Turning to slide nine, and we'll discuss the exceptional items for the third quarter. In fact, I also highlighted the same, point, the same items in our last call during uh, the second quarter. First pensions, <coughs> which we accounted for partly as an exceptional item in the second quarter. The update is that in July we formalized the agreement regarding a defined contribution plan as per IAS 19, the accounting guidelines in the Netherlands. 
the total exceptional gain before tax from the release of the pension provision is 19 million, including the cash contribution to be made by FOPAC. Secondly, the deconsolidation of our Venezuela operations for financial reporting was also mentioned at Q2 as a Q3 event. We've now reassessed the accounting position for this terminal and concluded that from an accounting point of view, we no longer have the basis to consolidate this asset. In the third quarter, the income statement therefore includes the effect of recycling historical unrealized currency translation losses from equity to the income statement. This reduces the reported net income with 51 million euros as an exceptional item. The deconsolidation is a non-cash event. It also has no significant impact on shareholder equity as equity was already adjusted in previous reporting periods each quarter over the years applicable. Going forward, <coughs> the participation in the terminal will be accounted for as an instrument measured at fair value. The contribution of the terminal to the results of FOPAC is immaterial. We will remain 100% shareholder and will continue to operate the terminal as before. Going to slide number 10, talking about our growth projects. The Associate Industrial Terminal PT2SB in Malaysia commissioned in September 2018 approximately 700,000 cubic meters of capacity. The remainder of capacity will be commissioned before the end of the third quarter, as I said before, 2019, and in line with plan. With respect to our growth ambitions, we announced today to expand our LPG and chemical gases network. Firstly, we will further expand our activities in South Africa with our partners retail, and we will invest in a new LPG import and distribution terminal with a capacity of 15,000 cubic meters in Richards Bay. This investment facilitates further imports of LPG as a cleaner energy into the South African market. In addition, and closer to uh, home, we will expand our gas terminal in Vlissingen, in the Netherlands, by 9,000 9, cubic meters of uh, LPG and chemical gases capacity, which will serve the Northwest European gas market. Both growth projects are expected to be commissioned in 2020 in the second quarter. Turning to the next slide, where we see a total overview of portfolio developments. Construction is progressing well and commercial coverage is high. The developments reflect execution of our strategy in line with our financial framework and towards 2019 momentum. Going to the next slide, and we've discussed fuel oil and our bunkering network on many occasions, and let me come back to it again today. Our priorities in this segment is to be ready for the IMO 2020 bunker fuel regulations that will come into force in the 1st of January 2020. Last call, we announced our investment plans for Rotterdam, where we convert roughly half a million cubic meters of capacity to handle very low sulfur fuel oil with Maersk as an anchor customer, which anchor customer was actually announced in July. Further to Maersk, we have recently, very recently, signed a second significant deal with a large oil and gas company for the largest part of the remaining low sulfur fuel oil capacity in Rotterdam. Conversion will be completed in the second half of 2019. Moving to uh, the non-IFRS proportioned information, slide number 13. And in response, as I said, to requests by investors, we provided the non-IFRS non 
IFRS Proportionate Consolidated Segment Information in this interim update uh, and will be doing so uh, going forward. The proportionate information provides transparency in underlying performance and provides a good comparable basis for subsidiaries, joint ventures and associates. EBITDA excluding exceptional items on a proportionate level amounts to 615 million euros year to date, third quarter 2018. And excluding Estonia and Hainan, the proportionate consolidated occupancy rate was 86%. So comparable to the IFRS based um, occupancy. Moving to uh, slide number 14, where I'll repeat some of our key messages. This quarter, we delivered a solid performance. We started our operations of our new industrial terminal in Pengerang in Malaysia towards 2019. We expand our LPG in chemical gases in South Africa and the Netherlands towards 2020. We focus on performance of delivery from our assets and businesses in 2018 through cost and commercial management and will be doing the same for the quarters to come. And therefore we manage long-term value through our strategic direction set towards 2019 and beyond. Slide number 15, looking ahead. Our outlook statement for 18 and 19 is fundamentally unchanged. The financial performance in 18 is expected to be influenced by currency exchange movements of the US dollar and the Singapore dollar mainly, and changes in the oil market structures. This impacts occupancy rates and price levels, mainly in the hub locations. Given the 3.2 million cubic meters expansion to be delivered in mainly 2019 with high commercial coverage and in conjunction with our efficiency program for cost management, FOPAC has the potential to significantly improve the 2019 EBITDA performance and again subject to market conditions and currency exchange movements. Our cost program uh, continues to develop well. Uh, and we've increased our cost target from uh, the earlier announced 25 and delivered mid-year 2018 to a number of 40 million to be delivered in end of 19. Lastly, end of November, we will have a Capital Markets Day in Houston, including a visit to our Deer Park facility at the Houston Ship, Ship Channel and Deer Park is commissioning its expansion of 138,000 cubic meters of capacity this quarter, and you will uh, be treated to a, a visit to the site. End November, we will talk about our views on the markets and portfolio developments, as well as our financial framework. And during the day, we will also give you some more insights in our digital agenda and application thereof at our network of terminals. Moving on, um, I finished my prepared remarks, so we can switch to uh, Q and A. I think we have till the hour to do so. We'll see how many questions there are and how much time we need. But I will meanwhile hand back to the operator to open the lines so that we can have some dialogue. Thank you. Operator, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. If you do wish to ask a question, please press zero one on your telephone keypad now. If you wish to withdraw your question, you may do so by pressing zero two to cancel. Once again, it's zero one on your telephone keypad if you would like to ask a question, and there will be a brief pause whilst any questions are being registered. And our first question comes from the line of Thomas Adolf from Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is now open to ask your question. Morning, Gerard. Um, hope you're well. Um, just one quick question. Um, you've obviously reiterated your um, outlook for 2019 for EBITDA to significantly improve, 
But I had a more specific question on Pengarang. Um, obviously, it's ramping up. Um, as I understand it, there's a bit of a take or pay structure in there, so that even if there was some delay to the ramp up, that you actually get paid nevertheless. So if that's the case, there should be a decent amount of visibility on the potential EBITDA uplift in 2019. So I wondered whether you can quantify it a little bit more. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Yes, and I am well. Um, on the uh, uh, Pengarang Malaysia developments, we've commissioned and are in the process of commissioning 700,000 cubic meters uh, of capacity in Malaysia, as you, as you point out. And this is out of a total of 1.4 million uh, cubic meters that will be commissioned over quite a complex set of industrial machinery that sits behind our terminal uh, in terms of uh, the facilities that uh, the joint venture partners of the RAPID project, uh, um, um, Petronas and, uh, and Saudi Aramco, will be, uh, will be commissioning. Now, the commissioning pace of uh, the facilities will substantially be in the first quarter of 2019, um, and then there is a smaller part of commissioning still going on in the second and third quarter. So you will see um, part of the commissioning happening now, as I said, approximately half. Then there's another substantial part in the first quarter, and then there's the residual parts in the second and third quarter. Now, together with the commissioning, there's uh, a whole complex of commercial contracts that kick in. Some of them are um, based on actual uh, performance. Some of them are based on capital structures, etc., what have you. Um, so you will see that ramp up in the course of 2019. Uh, I think you will need to see the entire year come through before you actually get a good handle on uh, the financial effects. I'm not going to give a number on it. Uh, but it needs to stabilize in 2019 across the commissioning of, uh, of the projects. There are certain payment structures that indeed are uh, kicking in when you actually commission, when you're commercially ready, you're correct uh, in that, but the exact pacing of that is as per quite a complex set of uh, different contracts across different facilities. Okay, that's great. I hope the, so the commissioning pace gives you a flavor of, uh, of it. I would focus on the entire year. Yeah. Uh, maybe just a quick follow-up on the uh, Rotterdam uh, uh, conversion. Um, you know, uh, uh, half a million cubic meters with uh, Maersk, and, uh, and then you've got uh, uh, signed a major contract with a, with a major. Is it, is it why the preference for very low sulfur fuel oil and not for marine gas oil? Um, what is happening in the facilities in fuel oil, uh, Thomas, as you know, is people are trying to figure out what is the ideal mix for their particular uh, demand. Um, and at the same time, on the supply side, people are trying to figure out what can their lineup of refining uh, capacity actually produce. <coughs> and when those two come together, <coughs> People will make their choices on how to optimize. <coughs> excuse me. How to optimize volumes given pricing that is that is being set. Um, uh, very low silver fuel is is a component. Uh, marine gas oil is a component. There's other uh, fuel oils that will be mixed in the blends that people will ask for. So we do have the capacity to mix and blend, um, but we also will have capacity to accommodate very low sulfur fuel oil. So yes, you see the term very low sulfur fuel oil, but how people actually get to that composition, whether it's a straight supply of that particular product or whether there's a, a blended desire, 
uh, to accommodate is uh, to be seen. The MERS contract is uh, one which essentially goes into their own demand, their shipping demand, and they may take a few positions around that or may market somewhat uh, to third parties, I would assume. Uh, the second contract uh, is more a, let's call it a market uh, contract where a major oil and gas company has committed essentially its supply and taken a view on how demand will, uh, will be based for that. So it's a mix, uh, uh, truly, and we'll see how it plays out, uh, Adolf. Thomas, Thank you. excuse me. Right, yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Dominic Edrich from UBS. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Uh, hi there. Um, apologies. Probably another question on the uh, IMO 2020 and fuel oil um, on the same topic. I mean, given the very limited um, scrubber installation and the time remaining, obviously it appears as though ultra-low uh, sulfur fuel oil will be the uh, predominant form. Can you just discuss what you've done with your own capacity. You know, you've talked about the half a million cubes that you've converted in Rotterdam. Can you just talk about what you're doing elsewhere and how much capacity you're going to remain in the, um, in the traditional fuel oil uh, market? And just um, allied with that question, is it fair to assume, given your comments on the weakness um, you've seen because of the oil price structure, that the capacity that you've contracted with the likes of Maersk um, is maybe the area that's been the weakest? In other words, you know, could we assume that the fuel oil side has been where the occupancy has been lowest in the last few years? Um, and then and, and on a completely different matter, on 2019, I know there were some comments you had about, uh, on Reuters about you saying that most of your capacity, the new capacity, is covered. Can you just maybe give some numbers around how much of the capacity you've currently got covered by contracts? Thanks so much. Okay, um, a whole range of questions there. So the scrubber uh, capacity, um, first of all, I think important to confirm that IMO uh, itself has reconfirmed its commitment to implement the uh, new regulations, which also includes uh, their views on how ships that do take um, high sulfur fuel oil, uh, what conditions they meet, need to meet and whether a scrubber needs to be in, on board in order to demonstrate compliance, um, which is um, reconfirmed. So th this will happen, it seems, uh, and the market is, is getting ready for that. You're right, we have mainly uh, converted uh, high sulfur fuel oil capacity into the range that also Thomas mentioned, different products ranging all the way to low sulfur fuel oil, with a majority shift into into the uh, lighter products than the high sulfur fuel oil. And we've invested in different, and are investing in different uh, lineups at our terminal to allow blending, uh, different pumping capacity to allow pumping speeds, uh, etc. to accommodate that mix, but there's a substantial shift from high sulfur fuel into into accommodating the uh, into the other grades. Um, in the weakness that we've cited about oil market conditions, I think you can split it in two. One is IMO 2020, and the other one is the let's call it the crude market, and to some extent. Uh, clean petroleum products uh, in terms of backwardation or contango, which is uh, impacting um, the occupancy. Um, what you now see is a period of time in 17 and towards, uh, well, almost the entire year of 18, a backwardated market which is not favorable for storage. Uh, very recently, We've seen some moments of contango come back in the market. The market then immediately responds into its trading behavior. And you see some of that uh, coming through in, uh, in the numbers. I'm not going to split out IMO 2020 and uh, crude oil, uh, but there are both important factors into, uh, into our occupancy. 
Um, IMO 2020 will play out, uh, as I said, also with the commitment we have just received as an illustration in, in Rotterdam uh, towards the end of 19. Um, how the oil market will play out uh, in terms of backwardation or contango, we, we will see as it, uh, as it plays out. There's, there's not a, more, a lot more I can say about that. The other segments that influence our occupancy, which is chemicals, gases, LNG, they're performing well, either steady or healthy or improving. And we've also seen some pickup in the oil occupancy in, uh, in uh, for instance, uh, Europort. Thanks. So that's the, all your questions, Dominique. Or? Um, that, that, that was the first, the first bunch. Just very quickly, just on the 2019, um, I know there's some comments on Reuters saying about most of your capacity oh, yeah, for yeah, next year yeah, is covered. Yeah. Could you, is, there, is it possible to quantify that at all? Um, I think what we've said is high confidence, uh, which I would pitch somewhere between 50 and 100% uh, in terms of coverage. Uh, it's not 50 and it's not 100, but it's that type of range. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of David Kirstens from Jefferies. Please go ahead. Your line is open for your question. Hi, good morning, uh, gentlemen. A few uh, related questions from my side, please. First of all, regarding the, uh, the IMO 2020 and your conversion, just to confirm the, uh, the second customer that you recently signed that is part of the um, 0.5 million cubic meters in Rotterdam that you announced back in August, if I understood correctly. And then <clears throat> following up to uh, Dominic's question regarding the expectation that only 5% uh, of the global fleet will be uh, retrofitted with scrubbers. Do you not need to convert much more capacity than what you currently have announced? So you, you gave a number for Rotterdam, but could you also give an indication how much you have already converted in, in Singapore and in Fujara, please? And my understanding was that it is still below 50%, whereas yeah, given the number of scrubbers, you would expect it should be a lot more. Um, and then finally, regarding uh, the commissioning of, uh, of Pengerwang, in the presentation you highlight 700,000 cubic meters already commissioned at the end of September, but another 1.5 million to, to follow. Does it mean that you have increased the, the total capacity for, for Pengerwang? Because I think the last number I have in my model is 1.5 million cubic meters. Thank you very much. Okay, David, thank you. The, the second one is easy. The total is 1.5. The first 700 has been commissioned, so we're not increasing the number. Um, the 700 is what we are commissioning in this quarter. The 1.4 is what will be commissioned at the end of last year, uh, next year. Right. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, scrubber penetration and commitments of fitting that into uh, into vessels uh, and what percentages uh, are needed, uh, where and how and when, um, what we've said is across our portfolio, we have stress tested what will be needed in the market as we see play out. And in order to get to the right mix of products, um, you will need certain base capacity and you will see need certain, and that's why I mentioned, blending pipelines up uh, and um, pumping uh, capacity for your vessels. Uh, we will make adjustments and are making and have made adjustments in Europort, in, sorry, in the Netherlands, in uh, Singapore, in Fujairah, uh, and to a limited, limited extent in some of the other locations that handle uh, bunker fuels. The total that we need for that is 40 million uh, euros. We mentioned that before. That number hasn't changed. Uh, our insights in the lineup that we require hasn't changed. We are now implementing it. Some of it is still uh, being spent, so we can still make adjustments if we feel it's needed. Uh, that's not our anticipation. We think we're well set. Um, the market will need to price the different flows that come out. So if your premise is correct that um, the scrubber capacity is, is not going to accommodate, then that will reflect its... Um, 
that will be reflected in the pricing of the different flows. That will trigger different behavior again, and that may trigger installation of more scrubbers if high sulfur fuel is priced in such a distressed manner that it cannot uh, find the market otherwise. We have run the numbers. We're not going to give the proportions of how much we put in what bracket uh, across the high sulfur to very low sulfur fuel oil spectrum, uh, because that would show into our uh, commercial uh, competitive lineup, which we which we don't want to do. Um, I feel we're ready to accommodate the market, um, and we'll see how many people will put scrubbers on. Yeah. And the 0 0.5 million in Rotterdam, that is for Maersk and this second customer, is that correct? Yeah, that's by and large correct, yeah. yeah. Maybe if I may, one quick follow-up on the... Um, on the um, proportionate data that you provided, please. I think in the uh, second quarter you highlighted um, a difference between the IFRS occupancy rate and the proportions occupancy rate was largely related to uh, Hainan and Estonia, and now they are in line at 86%. What drives the, um, the improvement versus the difference you reported in the second quarter? Um, now let me try to uh, figure that one out. Um, what is your question exactly in terms of is there a different momentum from the second quarter to the third quarter? Because if yeah, I do you see an improvement in occupancy? AOS, if Correct. I include yeah. them, it's 84 percent. If I exclude them, it's 86 percent. Now the reason why I uh, or why we decided to exclude them is because they don't contribute to the results anymore because they have been impaired. So in order to get a proper read-through, which is the intention of what drives the EBITDA, um, I felt, we felt, it was appropriate to show it excluding those two, uh, two assets. Does that answer the question? Right, so there's no change in the, the underlying numbers compared to the second quarter? In terms of occupancy, no, no, no. It's uh, uh, for transparency. It's as I said. The if I were to include them, which in itself doesn't make a lot of sense, um, it would be two percentage points lower at eighty-four percent. Right. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Giacomo Romeo from Corey. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, first one is uh, on um, uh, China utilization. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, is uh, uh, very sensitive to single uh, um, asset uh, uh, movements. Just wondering if uh, you can give a little bit more uh, outlook for uh, uh, for, for that utilization if you expect it to uh, recover in the fourth quarter. Um, the second question is uh, on uh, IMO. Uh, you mentioned last quarter about the marriage contract this quarter, uh, another uh, contract for uh, your uh, um, new uh, storage uh, or upgraded storage in Rotterdam. Um, just thinking at this point uh, in, in, in the process, uh, what are the, would you say, are the key factors that uh, um, allow uh, attracting early demand for ultra low surface storage uh, from customers. Uh, you mentioned obviously blending and pumping. What do you make? What are you making to make uh, in order to make your uh, uh, offering better place, uh, uh, so to speak? Um, if you can provide a little bit more clarity, that would be helpful. Uh, okay, first uh, let's let's focus on uh, on China. Uh, I think the China performance, uh, um, indeed, as you point out, as I mentioned, uh, is sensitive to relative small capacity movements in a small set of uh, terminals that is in the consolidated uh, storage capacity number. So. Uh, as I said, even a relatively small change impacts uh, the number. There is some seasonality in China, typically first half and second half. Uh, there is also some contracting positions that uh, impacted the third quarter. There's nothing fundamental going on here. If I look at the trend for China 
it is uh, improving, as you see from the EBITDA uh, line that is immediately shown below the occupancy line. You see an EBITDA performance of 13.6 uh, million euros. Um, that includes, in all uh, fairness, the startup of Hiteng. <clears throat> so Hiteng which is the asset that has been out of production for, what was it, end of 2015 or thereabouts, is now coming back online and making a contribution into the, um, into the EBITDA. Uh, however, it's not in the reported occupancy rate for subsidiaries because it's an associate. Uh, so you see better occupancy coming through from Hiteng in EBITDA and in occupancy, uh, but the occupancy for subsidiary companies is essentially dynamics in the third quarter with a very minor impact on EBITDA. The trend is, uh, is going up. Chemical activity in China is doing it very well. It's competitive. Um, as it would be, but it is uh, doing well. I don't see a, a negative trend or a turning point in uh, in uh, China, Giacomo, across the different quarters. In fact, it's good news because we're starting up high tank. Uh, in terms of, uh, again, IMO 2020, uh, what drives uh, our decision to put a certain capacity um, and what drives our customers. What you see at the moment um, is that the material players are starting to make their decisions. Um, I think the, the rest of the market will at a certain moment sort of have to squeeze in into, into that supply-demand equation and take a decision on how they want to play in that market. But the big players, as we've now seen it, Maersk and the oil and gas company, decide not to wait for that moment, and they are ready to commit material uh, capacity for reasonable uh, time periods in, into, uh, into this market. It really will remain to be seen how the different grades of fuel oil will price. And these big players don't want to be, I guess, caught out by that, and they want to be ready to move their physical streams, because they also need to move the product from the refinery into the market or from the uh, storage into their vessels, um, and they feel ready to commit there. What, what do clients appreciate at FOPAC? I think what they also always appreciate at Volpac, which is our uh, offering at the terminal, our commitment to customer um, flexibility and services in a safe and responsible manner, I guess. Uh, in order to be able to offer that, we've made the commitments, as I said, to invest 40 million to anticipate what might be their wishes, uh, and those two discussions are now coming together quite nicely. Um, the scrubber penetration, we also gave the same answer to David. You know, we don't know how it plays out. It seems to be low at the moment. I agree with David and, and yourself on that. Uh, I think ultimately the consequence of that is that high sulfur fuel oil um, we'll have to be uh, seeing a price impact of that because the volume will, to a large extent, still come to market. And then the market will respond. Very clear. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Tice Berkelder from ABN AMRO. Please go ahead. Your line is now open for your question. Yeah, good morning. Congratulations with the results. Uh, first question on LNG. I see quite a lot of, uh, let's say, corporate costs relating to I, uh, uh, LNG. Uh, Four million, I believe. Uh, 
can we you maybe give some indication or guidance on on what to expect in the coming quarters there in terms of uh, let's say pre-operational expenditures a uh, second question on high tank I think high tank was one month in business previous quarter three months this quarter uh, how would you describe the performance is it already back to normal or or, or will that take another year or so uh, uh, then a third question is uh, in the press release you're stating that the strategic review and testing of the market values of the the terminals in Algiers, Amsterdam, Hamburg and Tallinn is progressing on schedule what do you exactly mean with on schedule. Okay, Thijs, that is uh, three questions I will deal with. Thank you. And thanks for the uh, uh, diligence in following the high tang uh, uh, startup uh, sequence. Indeed, you are absolutely right. It, it produced one month in uh, the second quarter. It now contributed three months. Uh, it's fair to say that the startup uh, of a complex like this, including the um, startup of the related facilities of our uh, customer, uh, is a complex process, so that will play out uh, over the next quarters. Uh, in addition, we will also be discussing <coughs> the settlement of, uh, let's say, the period which is behind us, where <coughs> parties agreed that because we all had different priorities focusing on technical um, um, investments to bring the facilities back online, operational requirements, um, the safety, health and environment uh, focus we need to have on those discussions, to park those commercial discussions for the interim period. Uh, we're now getting to a point where Parties are ready or starting to get ready to concentrate on that again and engage. So that's another factor of, uh, of um, commercial, financial uh, settlements that still need to play out over the forthcoming period. Um, so I would give it a, a few quarters, uh, ties for this to, to play out. Um, LNG cost. Um, in fact, these are what I would call good cost. Uh, we've decided uh, um, not too long ago to have a LNG division in FOPAC to concentrate on capturing our part of this high growth uh, segment in the in the market. Um, it is becoming more successful. Uh, the market is now coming to us in terms of identifying opportunities and seeing whether we can uh, create a new business development opportunity and deliver it into uh, an investment decision. We're working on Hamburg LNG. We're working on Pakistan LNG, where we see also opportunity to expand further than the 29% we've already spoken about earlier. We're talking about China LNG um, in the Yangtze River, which we've mentioned before. Uh, there's some other discussions in, in China going on and other places in the world. That triggers an amount of new business development cost uh, that we're happy to spend. Um, sometimes these things are successful, sometimes uh, not. You've seen some of this cost comes through in, uh, amongst other, the, the third quarter. So I would not be too worried about that. I think it's uh, a little bit higher than uh, normal uh, this quarter, maybe uh, well, two or three million higher than normal. Um, and we'll, we'll see how that uh, plays out. In itself, it's good cost uh, that we are happy to spend uh, in its own right. Um, the strategic review, progressing to schedule, what does it mean, or to plan, uh, at second quarter in July we said we would take 6 to 12 months to um, execute the strategic review, which includes uh, testing the value in the market. 
we're now more than three months, four months into that process. Um, we are starting to uh, engage with the market. Uh, we've taken a few on how to engage and what is the profile of those terminals which you need to have ready for your engagements with the market. We will then take our soundings back into the company, uh, discuss it at the, uh, at the executive board and see what we think of, uh, of that process. Timeline hasn't changed. Uh, we said six to 12 months and, and that's happening right now. Uh, it's going well in its own right. The preparations are going well. Uh, the material is getting uh, ready. Um, that's why I say we are on plan, on schedule. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Thijs. Thank you. Once again, if you would like to ask any questions, it's 01 on your telephone keypad to register. And our next question comes from the line of Kieran Mulder from ING. Please go ahead. Your line is now open. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, a question on uh, IMO 2020. So you have earmarked uh, a half million cubic meter for, um, for this IMO 2020, in fact, by uh, two uh, contracts. Um, can you tell me what, what more capacity do you have available if there's an, let me say if there's demand from a third and a fourth quarter, a fourth uh, uh, client uh, arriving in uh, Europort or somewhere else? Uh, across our network, uh, we have spoken earlier uh, about uh, 4 million uh, cubic meters of capacity, uh, which uh, for convenience I've excluded the Estonian uh, capacity, which is uh, a part of that strategic review which is going on, which is uh, 1 million. So the 4 million uh, we've got available in our network, the bulk of that is concentrated in uh, Fujara and Singapore and in Europort. I think we are well advanced in our commitments in uh, Europort. Uh, we are still seeing um, commercial opportunity in Singapore and in Fujara. In Singapore we are also uh, adding some, uh, as uh, Thomas actually raised earlier, uh, some MGO capacity into into the mix. Um, that was the 67,000 cubic meters that we were uh, that we announced, uh, I think, at Q1 as an expansion at uh, Sabarok in uh, Singapore. So there, there's a, another uh, stream being added to the to the mix. So to phrase that um, uh, positively, we still have commercial opportunity in Fujara and Singapore to commit into that market in, uh, in uh, 2019 towards the implementation. To phrase it negatively, we still have uh, opportunity to place fuel oil into that market in 2019 in Singapore and Fujara. And why am I saying it like that? Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, commercial discussion that you need to have on fuel oil uh, with a market that is still unsettled uh, on the supply and the demand side, as I just explained. In Europort, those contours of the market are by and large for us settled. In the other places, we think it will settle. We think we know what's coming. We stress tested the assets, we know exactly what to do, uh, but there's still some commercial um, distance to be covered to, uh, to utilize that, which, which is uh, a good opportunity, um, and it will play out, as I said before. A functional specification change in any of the product lines, whether it's petroleum products or any other product, or in other words, a dislocation of the market in itself is good business for Fopac. We live off sub matching supply and demand. So if that supply and demand needs to be matched, um, and we take a, a few on that, um, if we make the right call with the lineup of our capacity, we can accommodate the customers. 
uh, it has been uncomfortable in 2018 because that was almost a perfect negative storm also with the backwardation of uh, of um, the crude oil market and we'll see how that plays out in 2019 I'm not going to talk about the shape of the market uh, on uh, backwardation or contango in 19 but we have recently seen some moments of contango go into the into the market and it immediately responds uh, but we have predominantly a backward-dated market uh, year to date. Uh, I hope that gives you some context, uh, Kirijn. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask any questions, it is a zero one on your telephone keypad. Once again, that's a zero one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to register for a question, and there will be a brief pause whilst any remaining questions are being registered. And if there are no more questions registered, and I'll hand back to Gerard for any closing comments. Okay, thank you, Sarah, and, and thank you, uh, everybody on the call. Uh, we do appreciate uh, your coverage and your analysis um, and your uh, interest in the company. Uh, thank you for attending today. I would uh, want to summarize uh, as follows. Uh, we're satisfied with the performance year to date. We've delivered a solid uh, performance on the financial sort of quarterly uh, performance and we are de-risking 2019 in terms of capacity delivery. We're also seeing the contours of the fuel oil market uh, come through and today I've been able to talk a bit about uh, Europort in particular. Um, there's still a little bit of distance to go on that. Um, but uh, we feel uh, well positioned to accommodate that as the market uh, unfolds. The Q3 momentum uh, is uh, encouraging. Uh, the 86% utilization is a change uh, with one percentage point uh, from the second quarter, which is good. And our EBITDA performance and cash flow performance is uh, <coughs> is uh, solid or satisfactory or resilient, uh, whatever term you want to put on it, to deliver shareholder value in actual performance and in value creation through uh, growth. I look forward to hoping, hopefully seeing uh, most, if not all of you, at our Capital Markets Day in Houston. Uh, we look forward to it. Hopefully we talk a little bit more than IMO 2020 only. But no doubt we will also talk about uh, that and not to worry, we are more than happy to do so um, every time it comes up. So thanks again for your questions, thanks for your support, thanks for being with us and speak to you next time. Operator, you can now close the call. Thank you. This now concludes our conference call. Thank you all for attending. You may now disconnect your lines.